is the nanotechnology, what is the meaning of nanotechnology, and what is the importance of nanotechnology in daily life. And then I will uh, explain spintronics and other spintronics and nanomagnetism related applications. Okay, so what do we mean with nanotechnology? You know that the nano is equal to 10 to uh, minus, uh, nanometer uh, is equal to 10 to minus 9 um, meter. So 1 billion times smaller than the meter. Okay, very, we are talking about very small um, um, distance. So um, indeed we are talking about atoms. I mean, we will talk about the interactions between atoms and atomic structures. Here, a table from the Merrill Lynch. So it explains the um, birth of nanotechnology around 1997, um, especially after discovery of the scanning handling microscope. Then, uh, this is the um, birth of nanotechnology and it still continue until 2025. So this is the production stage of the nanotechnology. People will um, start to use nanotechnology in daily life very much. And then this is the saturation of uh, technology. Okay, You see, we are still um, at the beginning of this technology. So what happens at nano CK. For example, here you see a gold. Gold has its uh, certain color, right? And it has melting temperature around 1064 centigrade. But this is um, gold in bulk conditions. But what happens if we produce very, very small gold particles? For example, if we produce one nanometer size gold particles, this melting temperature drops to 700 centigrade. This was bulk gold, <coughs> this is one nanometer gold. And the melting point drops to this temperature. And then the color of the gold particles changes. Okay? So wavelength is, changes. Uh, is, is changing. And uh, if we produce 20 nanometer sized gold particles, then gold gets red. Have you heard about red gold? Yes, if you produce 20 nanometer sized gold particles, the color of the gold is red. And if you increase the size of gold nanoparticles uh, up to 100 <coughs> nanometer, then the melting temperature is around again 100 cent uh, centigrade and the uh, color, gradient of the color is 575 nanometer. So you see that by changing the um, size of the nanoparticles, you can play with the physical and chemical properties. So what is the reason for that? The reason is that uh, the surface to volume ratio increases, okay? So surface fx becomes dominant at the nanoscale. Do you have a question? Yeah, it's not the property of the, it's the result that's the diffraction, the change of the color, or is the really a property of the material? Just the real of the pro really property of the material. Okay, so uh, there are many uh, dreams to apply nanotechnology in medicine, in military, in textile industry, in automotive industry, there are many dreams. And this is also a one of the dreams. Nanodoctors or molecular machines. For example, um, you have uh, some pain uh, in your body in somewhere. So you uh, store these nanodoctors in some place, like a garage, okay? And then if um, any problem occurs in your body, this nanodoctors goes there and then repair and uh, solve the problem and then they turn back to the old position, okay? Uh, these are the molecular machines, but of course uh, 
and this, this is still a dream. And this is already applied in technology, um, rather, absorb, rather absorbing materials. Maybe you have already heard about this, for example, in um, flight, play, um, flight planes or in some uh, flight ships, also in some uh, copters. People use this technology. So what you have, you have uh, some uh, material covered on this plane. So, um, but the material is magnetic nanoparticles. So this magnetic nanoparticles has special properties. So they absorb the rather signal, okay? And they do not reflect back. They uh, scatter it, okay? They do diffuse scattering, so you cannot see them by the rather absorption. And uh, another important uh, application of nanotechnology is um, nanocomposites um, applied to uh, ships and other <coughs> marines in order to decrease the maintenance cost because um, you have to clean this part of ships and this uh, under marines uh, every year or after some hours because uh, they are um, they get dirty so um, if you cover the surface of uh, this uh, big, big, uh, this uh, ships, then uh, finally uh, you will um, you will get uh, less uh, dirty material on the surface. And uh, this is also another important uh, application of nanotechnology. This is already used; people use it. Uh, maybe you heard uh, from the uh, internet or also from the TV. Uh, this is called as lattice effect. So. Um, this um, lotus effect occurs at certain surfaces which are hydrophobic surfaces. Okay? Hydrophobic surface means that you drop water on the surface, but the drop let, um, does not spread on the surface. It stays like this, okay? it does not enter into the material. So uh, with this technology you can produce uh, many um, textile products and also furniture products and also uh, it is used in automotive uh, industry and also in the uh, buildings especially um, outside the glasses okay let's come to spin throws <coughs> so we know that in electronics we use the charge of electron okay so uh, in semiconductor uh, technology, in integrated circuits, uh, we use the charge of electron. They are very fast, okay? So we can do our jobs very, in very fast way. But in magnetism, we use the spin property of electrons. So for example, in magnetic hard disk drives, in order to store information, we use the spin property of electrons. So finally, electron has two properties. One is charged. The second one is spin. Spintronics, namely spin-based electronics, would like to use this both charge and spin property of electrons in a single device. So what is the result? The expectations are the much smaller devices, much faster devices, non-volatile devices. Non-volatile means for example, you have integrated circuits based on the semiconductor technology. When you switch off the electricity, you lost the stored information, okay? In random access memories, for example. But in magnetic devices, when you switch off the electricity, your information is still there on the hard disk, okay? So non-volatile means that without electricity, you can preserve your information. And uh, they work at very uh, low uh, the power consumptions. Okay, uh, spintronics has two parts. The first one is semiconductor-based spintronics. The other one is uh, metal-based spintronics. The metal-based spintronics is very successful one. It is discovered in uh, 1988 by two groups independently. One was German group, 
um, where is it, Peter Grunberg from Forschung Centrum Juli in Germany. Uh, they published a paper, uh, they sent the paper in 1988, but it is published in 1989, just one year after submission. And simultaneously, uh, Albert Fert, a French physicist, they uh, published a paper in PRL in 1988. So after this effect, metal-based spintronics became very, very successful, and every computer um, sellers need to pay um, money to these guys due to their invention. So what was the invention? Invention, invention was giant magnitude resistance. Here you have um, two ferromagnetic layers. Red ones are the ferromagnetic layers, and they are separated by a non-magnetic layer. This um, yellow color shows non-magnetic matter. For example, copper it can be. But the thickness of this interlayer is very small, around um, one, two, three nanometers, something like this. If the magnetization of these two ferromagnetic layers are parallel to each other, if you derive current from this layer to this, you will see very low resistance. But if you change one of the magnetizations of uh, layers, you will see very high resistance. So what is the meaning of this? This is 1, this is 0 in computer data storage technology. Okay, this discovery boomed the storage capacity in hard disks. Very important discovery, and uh, they um, awarded by Nobel Prize in 2007 due to the discovery of this effect. Another important uh, metal-based spintronic result is tunneling magnetic resistance. The mechanism is more or less same but we replace the interlayer by insulator. Here we have metal, but here we have insulator. At the beginning they used aluminum oxide, but nowadays people use magnesium oxide in geo, because it um, gives much better results. So the mechanism is say, if, if the magnetization of ferromagnetic layers are parallel to each other, you see low resistance. If they are anti-parallel, then you see high resistance. Again, one and zero state, this is also used in magnetic ramps, and they are introduced by IBM recently. This is uh, MRAM, this mechanism, but you have hundreds, thousands of them in a single device. The size is very small. Here you can see many of them, and uh, there are, uh, how to say, these are the um, the mechanism is that you drive current, for example, you drive current from this and here. So with this uh, spin transfer torque mechanism, you can change the magnetization of one of the layers. It means that you can change the, uh, the position of the bit element. Just by applying very small current, you can make this bit one or zero. Or you can also read this torque bit via flowing a very, very small currents. This is the mechanism of um, MRAMs, and um, as I told you, it is um, done by IBM recently. And uh, let's talk about perpendicular magnetic recording. So please remember that just 10 years ago, what was the maximum uh, hard disk sizes? I mean, a storage capacity of hard disks around 40 gigabytes, something like this, right? But now we are talking about one terabyte. So how it happens? The size is same. The laptop sizes are same. Or external hard disk sizes are same, but the capacity is increasing. It is not written. Uh, it is not only written on on on, on the um, cover of the hard disk. But inside, something happened. So what happened inside? The answer of this question is perpendicular magnetic recording. For example, you know that CDs 
stored 700 megabytes, right? Mm -hmm. And DVDs around 4 gigabytes. The size is same. You use same readers, same CD DVD readers. The size is same, but you can store more information. So it is related to the size of magnetic domains, okay? But this size has some limitations. You cannot decrease more. At certain size, we have some limitations. Then you have to choose these limitations by perpendicular recording, okay? So with perpendicular recording, you can store lots of information per inch square compared to the in-plane recording. Here you see, for example, a hard disk element, that's a disk, but the information is stored in the film plane. So magnetizations and bits are stored in the film plane. But please look at here. At the same size with this one, you have one, two, three, four bits, right? With more or less same size, we have one, two, three, four, five, many. Okay. So with perpendicular recording, you can you can um, increase the capacity of storage devices. And um, in order to make perpendicular recording, your material should have perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. Uh, during last talk, um, I couldn't find enough time to explain the magnetic anisotropy in detail. Um, here I will uh, shortly touch on this. For example, here I have one ferromagnetic layer, here I have another ferromagnetic layer, and they are separated by non-magnetic layer, like this one here. But the magnetization of both layers are perpendicular. But how to do that? In order to do that, you have to grow very, very thin films below the nanometer scale around a few angstrom. For example, if you would like to make this device from the cobalt, cobalt is ferromagnetic material, and you would like to create perpendicular anisotropy with cobalt material, this thickness is around 4 angstrom. 4 angstrom means two atomic layers of cobalt, very thin. So then, difficulty starts here. First of all, you should be able to grow this very thin films, and you should be able to characterize, analyze, observe, detect these very small particles and thin layers. This is also a very important mechanism. Um, in order to make perpendicularly magnetized material, um, as I told you, we should do very thin film. So please look at this formula here. This is effective uh, anisotropy constant. It contains volume anisotropy and it contains surface anisotropy. If the film is very thick, if you have very thick film, then this term goes to zero. Then volume anisotropy becomes dominant. But if you would like to create perpendicular anisotropy, you should, uh, you must um, repay very thin films. When the thickness is decreased, these parameters becomes very dominant. Then you can able to observe perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. Of course, I repeat it again. This occurs at very, um, very small limits around the feet angstroms. Okay, uh, this was the successful part of spintronics. We already use it, and um, people try to um, develop this field of nanomagnetism. And there is another field of spintronics. This is called as semiconductor-based spintronics. This is the unsuccessful part of the spintronics. Uh, during the last 20 years, many people um, work on this issue, but up to now, we don't have any device working at room temperature. We have devices working at low temperatures, like superconductivity, but at, low, at room temperature, we don't have any devices. Are you tired? Are you on the line? <laughs> you are just watching. <laughs> okay, 
So um, this is a new topic. For example, here you see some atoms of semiconducting material. For example, zinc oxide or gallium arsenide. Okay, there are two atoms. This is a semiconducting material and does not contain any magnetic atoms. It is not magnetic. But if I replace some atoms of this semiconducting material with some magnetic atoms, if I put some magnetic atoms into this semiconductor, then I should expect semiconducting and magnetic properties in a single material. Okay? This is the motivation. Up to now, uh, people use this gallium arsenide because it is well known semiconductor material and used in industry a lot. But the problem of this material is that TC is around 170 Kelvin. It means that if you make device with this material, then you cannot use it here. You should use uh, under uh, low temperature conditions. Please. Absolutely equal to the problem. Sorry? After that, it's also a problem to make your uh, uh, not device. In, um, not exactly. During preparation, yes. It is a poison, uh, you know, um, during preparation. Okay, but when you prepare gallium arsenide, it makes bonding, so it is not dangerous. After manganese doping, it becomes ferromagnetic and it also shows semiconducting properties. But the problem is curie temperature of this material. For this reason, people looked for different types of materials. For example, this is a theoretical work published in Science just 24 years ago. It is published, it is published Science, but the paper is not correct. And this paper is one of the most decided papers in the level of science. But it gives some idea. So what they have done, this is only theoretical work. They got manganese atoms around 5% and put on this semiconductors. For example, silicon, germanium, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, zinc oxide, indium arsenide, for example, uh, these materials. And they calculated that only gallium nitride and zinc oxide becomes ferromagnetic above room temperature after doping 5% manganese atoms. This is theoretical calculation. After these calculations, people start to work on gallium nitride and zinc oxide, but experimentally, nobody can form this behavior, this manganese because calculation was wrong. But what, the, what was the help of this theoretical result that people concentrated on zinc oxide and start to dot another materials, cobalt, iron, nickel, this kind of ferromagnetic metals, and they found that zinc oxide becomes ferromagnetic above room temperature after doping of coal atoms. This was the first experimental result. So, um, how we can use this? Of course, uh, this type of material is called as diluted magnetic semiconductors because they contain very low amount of magnetic moments within the material. And where they would like to use this type of materials, they would like to use it in spin field effect transistors. You know, in normal integrated circuits, we use many transistors and LEDs, right? They are semiconductor based devices. And uh, we would like to replace them with the magnetic ones because magnetic field effect transistors and magnetic LEDs consumes less electricity, and this is very important. So this is, uh, this was an idea proposed by Data and Das in 1990. This is field effect transistor. Here, they have source material. They inject electrons from this source, and they detect electrons from the drain. 
and here they have two dimensional electron uh, gas channel. This is insulating and this is the gate. So what they have do, uh, this source and drains are the ferromagnetic materials and they have some certain orientation of magnetization. They are parallel to each other. If I inject electrons from this ferromagnetic material to here, we can align, we can um, inject ferromagnetically aligned electrons, okay? Then I can measure the current here. So uh, I can measure current, so transistor is open. But if I change ferromagnetism of the uh, one of the ferromagnetic uh, materials, then I will not see any current here. So a transistor will be closed. But in reality, it works like this. I have parallel orientation of the source and drain. And then uh, when I inject electrons here, I apply gate voltage. When this gate voltage is well enough, I can rotate the spin polarization of electrons until they reach here. So it becomes anti-parallel to drain. If it is anti-parallel, transistor is closed. Okay? So if there is no current, then uh, they can pass through like this. If there is a gate voltage, then transistor is closed. This is the working principle of the bus transistor. This is experimentally a shift only at 4 Kelvin by a Japanese uh, group, but at room temperature it is not working. Why is gate voltage changed? It is um, due to rush bus spin orbit coupling. Uh, Rush bus spin over coupling mechanisms uh, mechanism um, change this uh, spin orientation of electrons in this two dimensional electron channel. This um, this is um, I mean, very strong and hard theoretical um, effect. Rush bus spin over coupling. Okay, this is another part of uh, spintronic product. This is also unsuccessful at room temperature, but this is uh, visualized at um, low temperatures. Um, again, here we have um, gallium arsenide substrate. Here we have indium gallium arsenide. And here we have gallium arsenide spacer. And here I have diluted magnetic semiconductor, manganese dot gallium arsenide, so gallium manganese arsenide. This is ferromagnetic, so I apply current here. So uh, holes are coming from this gallium manganese arsenide and they recombine here in this gallium, indium gallium arsenide. Then we get lead, light. But the property of this lead is um, much different from the semiconductor LEDs. In semiconductor LEDs, they don't have any polarization. In this type of devices, they will have polarized LED. So depending on the magnetization, they will be able to manipulate the polarization of LEDs also. This is another property of this type of devices. And as I told you, uh, it is only a shift at low temperature by the Japanese group. Okay, uh, for um, DMS applications, people use uh, many um, materials, for example, titanium dioxide, normally insulating material, titanium dioxide, but if you dot titanium dioxide with magnetic cobalt atoms, for example, 10% or 20%, titanium dioxide becomes ferromagnetic, but ferromagnetic insulated. I need ferromagnetic semiconductor. But the good thing is that if I dot cobalt, cobalt also introduces carriers into this material and this material turns to semiconductor also. So just by cobalt doping, titanium dioxide becomes ferromagnetic and uh, semiconductor. Zinc oxide is also another material. Um, many people and we also got very good results by cobalt doping into zinc oxide. But, um, there are also many uh, problems and there is uh, no device uh, with this type of materials. Okay, as I mentioned in the morning, 
Magnetic nanoparticles are also um, be used in um, magnet, uh, magnetic resonance imaging of cancer cells. So what is the mechanism? We have, these are the magnetic nanoparticles and uh, they are covered with poison and after poison coverage they are covered with proteins. So when the cancer cells eat these nanoparticles you can um, easily detect them by magnetic resonance imaging because they contain magnetic nanoparticles okay and this gives opportunity to define the cancer region very well okay so you know the size and the magnitude of the cancer region of body very well and another mechanism is that when you send these nanoparticles into the cancer cells when they eat it poison poison becomes active and then kills the cancer cell but this killing becomes selectively for example in chemotherapy or radiotherapy you also destroy non-cancer region of the body right so you create another diseases in the body but if we can kill the cancer cells selectively this will give efficient um, uh, efficient uh, solution of uh, cancer. Okay, so how to produce nanoparticles, how to produce very thin films for uh, nanotechnology, nanomagnetism and spintronic applications. We need UHV conditions, ultra high vacuum conditions. We can use molecular beam epitaxis, the past is the position, CVD or lithography. So, or sometimes combination of them. For example, you would like to um, uh, grow, for example, an oxide material. You can grow it in spots or PLD. But if you would like to grow single crystalline metal, MB, MBE, does this job better than the others? So you have to uh, use combination of this UHV growth methods. And uh, in order to observe and check the uh, structural character, structural properties of these materials, atomic force microscopy is used, scanning electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy, and also um, EDS uh, modes of the electron microscopy can be used, and also X-ray diffraction. It is also very old but very useful method it is also non-destructive and uh, it is not necessary to prepare your sample as you did for the TM it is very easy very fast method x-ray diffraction so you can um, you can see even very small clusters this the size of five six nanometer is this method and you can characterize ultrasound films the structure and anisotropy of ultrasound films is this method and magnetic characterization, especially if you would like to use this nanostructural magnetic materials for data storage technology, you have to characterize them in magnetic properties. So uh, MOOC will help us, magneto-optical carry effect. It is very fast method and VSM or um, SQUID will help us and also uh, nuclear magnetic resonance will help us. And Electron spin resonance uh, spectrometry also will help us to observe very, very small uh, magnetic ions um, or particles in our material. Of course, in order to create a real device from this material, you have to uh, know the electrical properties of these materials. Mobility, carrier concentration, carrier type, you have to know all these parameters in order to use these things in the real devices. For this, uh, for example, we have a special um, tool to measure the resistivity, Hall effect, or anomalous Hall effect of ferromagnetic materials. You can integrate this one into any helium diva or any um, 
standard uh, measurement methods. Hocam ne kadar vaktim var? Bitti galiba. Bitti mi? Um, okay, I will uh, finalize with this one during my second lecture in the morning. I have told you that antiferromagnetic materials are very important materials in technology in industry. Here you see one ferromagnetic layer, here a spacer layer, and another ferromagnetic layer. They are parallel to each other, and I drive current. They, you see very low resistance, so this is one state in computer technology. But if you change one of the magnetization of magnetic layer, you will see high resistance, this is called as zero state. But during changing magnetization of this layer, how to fix the magnetization of this bottom layer? It is really hard issue. In order to fix this bottom layer, we use antiferromagnetic materials. Due to exchange interaction between this ferromagnetic material and antiferromagnetic layer, I can pin or fix the magnetization of bottom ferromagnetic layer. So it is called as pin or fixed layer. So antiferromagnetic materials are used for this purposes in reed hats in magnetic hard disk drives. I think with this, uh, it is enough. I have also another transparencies, but you are very uh, tired. Thank you for your attention.